Good to have you here on this Father's Day. We've been talking in our sermons for several weeks about the balancing of the Christian life because there are things in the scripture that tell us one thing and it seems like it kind of tells us something else and we wonder, well, which is it? And how do we balance the teaching that's there? And so we've taken a lot of different subjects. And this morning we're going to look at choices because there are right choices and wrong choices. There are better choices. And there's a discipline, a certain amount of discipline that's required of us in those choices. So listen to Romans 6.19 as it points out two different things. Just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now since you've changed and become a believer and a Christian, offer them in slavery to righteousness, leading to holiness. Let's pray. God, that's your word to us. Your word is powerful. It's strong. It speaks to us. It connects to things that we're dealing with, thinking about, facing. And I just ask that your Holy Spirit, in his very unique way, would meet with our heart today. Talk to us in ways that only you as God can. And open our hearts to that voice. That still and small, and unique, and yet so powerful. Come to us in Jesus' name. Amen. I remember hearing the testimony of a man who came to a Bible study, the first Bible study he'd gone to, and the leader said the Bible was not given specifically or only for knowledge, to increase that knowledge, but to guide your conduct. And it was just like a light switch went on in his head. That might be obvious to you and me because we've been around a while. But it was not so much to him. And it wasn't that he wasn't a believer. He'd even grown up in the church. He'd been to different kinds of groups, Sunday school classes, um, memorized some scripture, prayed. But applying it was really something new to him. And that may sound amazing because we often talk about the application of God's word. And yet, is it possible that we can go through a lot of religious exercises and not really think about applying this to our life? So at night at home, he prayed and asked that God would take the Bible and let it be the guide for his conduct in life. And he said as he prayed about that, he just took on a whole different approach to his religious life. More than Christianity, it gave it purpose and gave it life. Friends, it's not just knowledge. It's not just good stuff that we can dish out but it's meant for you and I to live. And you and I know that it's a relevant book and it gives instruction and guidance for our daily lives. And so in those daily lives, we're continually facing choices. Life is just one series, a constant series of choices, one right after another, many of which involve moral choices. For example, the route that you take to work isn't particularly a moral choice. But what you think about on that route to work may be a moral choice. So let's turn, as we look at our choices, to the Bible in Ephesians 4. And there's several verses here, verses 25 to 32. And I want you to listen to the choices that are described here. Therefore, each of you, 
should put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with his hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for the building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Now there are lots of practical instruction and application in those verses. And it's setting up the choices, because we have lots of choices in life. You can be truthful or tell a lie. You can deal with anger or let it smolder in your mind. You can be honest in your finances or you can steal. Which do you do? Do you share with those in need or do you spend it mostly on yourself? Do you speak? Here's a good one. Do you speak only what's helpful? Or are you critical and gossip? Be kind and compassionate and forgiving? Or are you bitter and angry and resentful? Wow, there's a lot of practicality there with the choices. What choice are you making? In other words, the practice that we've been talking about for several weeks in the sermon series is often putting off and putting on. Putting on the Christ-like character. It, it involves constant choices. Our choices are going to determine our direction. You know that. But it's determined one choice at a time. And these choices that we make will lead us to Christ-like behavior or to godless behavior. Habits, they're just repetitions of behavior. And it's in the arena of moral choices that we develop these spiritual habit patterns toward holiness. It comes to one or the other, choices do. So listen to Romans 6.19 that I read earlier. Just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, now offer them in slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. Before becoming Christians, these believers in Rome were offering their bodies to ever-increasing wickedness. That the more they sinned, the more they wanted to sin. And sometimes you found that out, haven't you, in your own life. The more that tempts you, the more you start finding other things that tempt you more. and You want to go there. They were constantly de um, deepening their habit patterns of sin simply by the practice of certain things. And what was true of the Romans can be true of us today. That it's ever-increasing wickedness. Sin, it, it clouds our reason. It will dull our consciences at times. It will stimulate our sinful desires. And because of that, each sin reinforces that habit of sinning and makes it easier for us to do the next time. Paul gets them to think otherwise. Okay, you've been in this habit pattern, this movement, this direction, all these choices. You've made them one at a time. They're going in that direction. But Paul encouraged them to turn their habit to godly living. The second part of that verse, Romans 6, 19, now offer parts of your body in slavery to righteousness, leading to holiness. Righteousness in, in this passage is referring to the ethical rightness, the right conduct that we might have, that, 
the conduct that we practice and possess every day because righteousness refers to conduct and holiness to our character. What are we really inside? Holiness, our character, is developed one choice at a time. Choosing this time to act righteously, and here's another situation, so I choose this time to act righteously, and then this time to act righteously. It's a series of choices that we make. And all that I've been preaching about for several weeks is leading up to this point this morning, that we don't become holy by um, discipline or by dependence or by commitment or by conviction, although I've preached about each one of those separately and the discipline of each one of those in our lives. But we become holy by obedience, by the choice that we make to obey or not obey, specifically in the word of God. But it's true that our obedience comes out of our discipline and our dependence and our commitment and our convictions. But as we involve ourselves in making convictions and making commitments and in depending upon God, as we do all those things, it leads us to this point of action. What are you going to do with that now? Your obedience. And we only make the right choices with the enabling power of the Holy Spirit. You've all seen quilts. We have one that the church gave us several years ago that um, Gail Maybe made for us. And it has a pattern on it. Every quilt has a pattern. And you know, each of the squares are made separately, and then they're sewed together. And we could say this morning that we have the square of conviction and the square of dependence and the square of discipline and the square of commitment. And as you make a quilt, there's always a backing and there's an inner lining. And that inner lining for our lives as we pursue holiness and try to put our holiness quilt together, it's the Holy Spirit that's in between those layers holding it all together. Each square has its own beauty, and they're all working together to produce the product, and that end product is God's holiness. But it requires your obedience and mine, and we obey one choice at a time. So all of us are moving in some direction. What's your direction? Let's look at our direction We have to train ourselves or exercise ourselves spiritually in order for holiness to take place, in order for the quilt to finally come to completion. 1 Timothy 4.7 says, Train yourselves to be godly. Train yourselves, because it's not somebody else's responsibility, to be godly. And the words train, they also interchange the word exercise here, taken from an athletic scene, where you're prepared for an event or a game. And likewise, we train ourselves for life, for a specific action, a specific choice today. What am I going to choose today? How do we exercise and train ourselves in a spiritual world? It's by the choices we make. What happens when we make wrong choices? When we choose sin over obedience? You know, you can train yourself in the wrong direction very clearly as well as train yourself in the right direction. When we reinforce our sinful habits that we've developed, we allow them to have greater strength in our life. Look at 2 Peter 2, 14. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable, They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. Peter is illustrating um, the false teachers who were present in groups around them, how they were experts in greed. And he was talking about these false teachers, translating it, their heart is trained in greed. 
They were training themselves to the point where they just became more and more greedy. How did that happen? They were training themselves in the wrong direction. Well, they were committing themselves to making money from their false teaching. You know, they were developing this doctrine that was false, and they found that the more they said, the more money they got. And the more they played with the ideas, it lined their pockets a little bit more. And so by each choice that they made, they were getting more and more greedy, increasing wickedness within them. Instead of generosity and sacrifice, they were experts in greed. It was the opposite training from training yourself to be godly. Now that should be sobering to us because in a sense, we can train ourselves in wrong ways. It's possible to discipline or train ourselves in very clearly in wrong directions. You know, disciplined people, sometimes we admire and think, oh, they've got it together. You know, they've really worked at this, and they've been, they demonstrate that. But do they do the things they should do? The truth is, we're probably all disciplined to some degree, but what direction is it? And where are your choices leading you? In what direction are you disciplined? In a right one or a wrong one? And I'm sure God's Spirit has his way of showing you right now. What's your movement? What direction are you going in? Our choices are so important, and we need to make tough choices. So let's look at those. God wants to train us in the right direction, and here's where it gets really hard. And none of us like to hear this or feel its pressure. But we're going to agree, oftentimes, we hear a teaching from the Bible or a church or wherever on a particular subject of sin, and even when we make a commitment to it in our lives, here comes temptation again. I made a commitment last week or yesterday or whenever it was, but here comes temptation again. And when temptation comes... We're unwilling to say no. We're unwilling to make the tough choices. Sure, we could be rid of that sin and we pray for God to help us, but are we willing to say no and stop? Every day we're training ourselves in one direction or the other. Every day it's one choice, and what's that choice? Are you willing or unwilling? Will you lie or will you be honest? Will you be selfish or unselfish? Will you covet or be generous? Angry or unforgiving? Pure or impure? Irritable or patient? Proud or humble? Materialistic or simplistic? Think about those persistent sin patterns that you may have. Maybe by now, as we've talked in this series of sermons, you've identified those, and hopefully you've made some kind of commitment toward those. And we keep pointing to those, asking you, in a sense, how you're doing. Praying over them, maybe finding some scripture that addresses those specific things. And I know that in this process, we make mistakes, and we go in a wrong direction, and that's why we realize we're so entrenched. Right choices of obedience will break the habit of sin and develop habits of holiness. So Paul is telling us to turn our direction and start making good choices one at a time, and in time, it will lead to our holiness if we keep going in that direction. This is where we desperately need the power of the Holy Spirit to enable us in these choices. A couple weeks ago, we used a couple passages of Scripture that talked about just crying out to God, being desperate in that situation that you want to make this change. 
Dawson Trotman, the founder of Navigators, which is a disciple-based ministry, he would say, you're going to be what you're becoming. The same thought, you're going in a direction and you're going to be whatever direction you're going in. What direction are you going in? Philippians 2.13 tells us the Holy Spirit will work in us to will and to act according to his good pleasure in order for us to want to do it and to do it. That's the Holy Spirit's job. But we also have a job. So what does the Bible instruct us to do? Now here's an old-fashioned word that we use rarely. The Bible says, mortify. Mortify your sinful desires. And here's, that's one of the words that are used in the Bible. When I was a, a young teenager, my sister and I would throw that word around, kind of making fun of it because it's such an old word. Oh, I'm mortified. And we, it was as if we were embarrassed or humiliated by something. But to mortify means to put to death. Mortician deals with death as well. But this means specifically put to death those sinful choices. Paul says in Romans 8.13, For if you live according to your sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death or mortify the deeds of the body, you will live. Now, in order to make right choices, I have to put to death or mortify these deeds that I keep doing, one choice at a time. We are to put to death these sinful desires, the, this, these misdeeds that I continue to commit. Paul tells us in Colossians 3, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, Lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Now, he's not giving a complete list, but he's giving examples for us to get an idea. What does he mean? Well, these are some of the things that he means. And you and I deal with all of those at different times. Now, one thing that we clearly see is that mortification or putting to death of sin is our responsibility. We are to do that. Not turn it over to God. Sometimes that can just be an easy Christian phrase, oh, I'll just turn it over to God. He'll take care of it. And both of these verses say really the same kinds of things or imply that, that we are involved. And if we don't, Paul says we're going to die spiritually, not physically. But we're going to die spiritually in this world. And the opposite of that would be true, too. That if I do put him to death, I'm going to live spiritually. And it's going to be a great life in this physical life. Paul taught that we're saved by grace through faith. But he also stressed that we are to work out, work out our salvation with fear and trembling. It's by grace, and yet I work it out. I do something. I'm involved in the process. I make some choices. I'm faced with those choices all day long. Those are sobering passages where it's a healthy, honest self-examination that needs to take place. So though temptations are going to continue to come, we need to have this earnest desire and sincere effort to put them to death. Kill them, get rid of them. Proverbs 27.20 Death and destruction are never satisfied and neither are the eyes of a man. The eyes of a man, we're always looking. We're always seeing what the world is offering and the world is offering all kinds of things and what appeals to you may not appeal to me but it, what appeals to me might not appeal to you but the world is offering stuff. And it's all the time coming into our sensory perceptions and we're taking it in and our eyes are leading us. 
though it is our responsibility, we can only deal with it by the enabling power of the Holy Spirit. Paul said, if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. You and I can't do it apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. He brings it about. That's his job to accomplish. I have mine, he has his. And while scripture emphasizes both of these things, we tend to lean kind of to one side or the other. We lean either toward self-discipline, I can whip this thing, you know, I'm a disciplined person. Or I'm throwing it all on God, it's all his responsibility. I'll pray about it and dump it there. And to some people, it seems, you know, more spiritual to say, I'll turn it over to God, and we should trust him. And to say, uh, to mention that we have some responsibility, sometimes people will say, well, that's just a work of the flesh. But to those who stress discipline, it means more responsibility to do it. When we use our willpower and maybe overcome it, it becomes a thing of pride. See what I did? Yeah, I can tackle that thing. So we move from one sin to another. Is that any better? And someone else tries and fails, and they become frustrated, and they feel guilty, and we generally are on one side or the other, but the Bible says there's a balance here. So how do we go about this? We know we have a sinful nature. All of us do, and we're never going to get rid of that as long as we're breathing. But the sins that tempt us, that hang around us, they're always offering themselves to us. That is what we have to put to death. When the temptation comes, put it to death. When it knocks on your door, put it to death. When nobody else is around, you put it to death. We do it by subduing sin. We deprive it of its power. We weaken the habit so that we can make the right choice. In some situations, you need to just get up and walk out. You need to leave. You need to change your circumstances. You need to redirect yourself or do something else in order to get away from it. And that weakens its power. Mortification involves dealing with all known sin in our life. Now, here's where it takes a little interesting twist because I thought we were just talking about those stubborn, persistent sins. No. We have to subdue every sin. And we do, oh, great. It's a universal obedience that the Word of God calls us to. And let me explain this. In 2 Corinthians 7.1, it says, Let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit. It doesn't say just tackle the persistent things, those stubborn things, those things that are unique to you. It says everything. You can't only mortify the impure heart without getting to the resentment underneath. You can't mortify a a fiery temper and its reaction without looking at the pride that's underneath. And hating only one, it's not enough. We have to hate all sin. And sometimes we think we're tackling something, and, and you might in a certain area, but there's more to it than just sometimes what's on the surface. Isn't that true? A man came to a pastor one day and wanted some help with his thinking and thoughts and actions in regard to lust. And he also had another problem with some interpersonal relationships of how he was always critical and put down people and found what was negative about him and was vocalizing about that. He wasn't concerned with that. He was only concerned with what really made him feel guilty. You know, being critical, we don't feel guilty about. They deserve that. Do you know what they're like? And we leave that alone. And we think that the only matter is this one matter. 
when there can be layers of stuff. And you have to deal with everything, it says. Wow. In our fight, it has to be done daily, constantly. Every day, sin comes knocking at our door. Every day, there are opportunities for us. Every day, there are things being presented that says, move in my direction. Every day, it calls us to compromise. And no believer, regardless of how spiritually mature we may think we are or are, ever gets past the need to mortify the sins of our body. No matter how many years we've walked with God, sin still comes knocking. And what are you going to do today? One choice at a time. We have to focus on sin's true nature, that persistent sin, because it disturbs our peace and makes us feel guilty. Realize that it's an act of rebellion against God. And it grieves him. The rebellion that we have is against the authority of God. But it's also a rebellion against our loving Heavenly Father who came to this world through his Son and loved us and gave himself for us. Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. The the Lord saw how great man's sin or wickedness on earth had become, and he was grieved that he made man. Sometimes when we look at our own lives and our own sin, we need to recognize God's grieved at this. That's where what comes into play when we talk about the fear of God. Yet God's Son came to die for every sin. And it filled his heart with pain. Often there's this underlying hostility in our sins because it represents authority. There's these underlying issues of authority. And the Bible sometimes talks about children and their obedience to their parents and they rebel, parent, or children rebel against their parents because they represent authority. And we can find numerous examples in the Bible where people were put to death not because of who they were, but because of what they stood for. They stand for authority. We're just going to get rid of them. It's not just the sin of killing, it's that they're fighting authority. We don't want it. We don't like it. We don't want anybody to have authority over us. Now apply this sense of authority to the sin that we want to kill or mortify. See it for what it is. It's rebellion against God. And here's where it begins. But it can lead us to having a right attitude toward sin. And that's what we need. Having a right attitude toward it. Sin is wrong, not just because of what it does, but because of the rebellion that's underneath against God. And that rebellion shows itself in our behavior. And we do some pretty awful things, but it's just rebellion against God. And if we're to succeed in putting to death this sinful nature, we have to realize it's not wanting what I want. It's wanting what God wants. So we come to the realization that it's putting to death our own desires. And we don't like hearing this. But we know that's true. And we know that sin appeals to us through our desires, and the Bible speaks to us about deceitful desires and evil desires and sinful desires, and those references are there. But let me read from Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Now Eve saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food. One thing. It was pleasing to the eye. Two and also desirable for gaining wisdom. Three, the desire was for good food, 
It pleased me to look at it and for gaining wisdom. Mortification is a struggle between my convictions and my desires. I've decided I'm going to follow Jesus, but my desires sometimes get gone. Mortification is that struggle. How am I going to deal with this? I need to put it to death. Galatians 5.17 says, For the sinful nature desires what's contrary to the spirit. Oh, yeah. And the spirit, what is contrary to the sinful nature? They're in conflict with each other so that you, not, you do not do what you want. So you do not do what you want because of this conflict. It's a struggle. The person who has a tendency to overindulge in sweets, don't look at me, will struggle between conviction of the importance of self-control and the desire for the temptation. Whatever our vulnerability is, mortification is required. It's a struggle. And it's painful to go through those desires, especially when they're patterns that are deep and that are strong. And we've made it so by our choices. They cry out to us for fulfillment. Paul says, put it to death. Put it to death. Put it to death. Since it's difficult work, could you ever involve a friend in that? Two are better than one, the Bible says. Share with another the struggle and the commitment that you want to holiness. Ecclesiastes 4 says two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, which will happen, his friend will help him up. But pity the man who fails and has no one to help him up. There are all kinds of words that the Bible uses to illustrate this with the phrases one another. Admonish one another. Two are better than one. Encourage one another. Confess to one another. Bear with one another. Pray for one another. Meaning we're to do life with some other people at times. And that's spiritual synergism, where your energy can help me because I'm low, or I'm deflated, or I need some help. And when you are, maybe I can give you that encouragement. We often need at least one person who's of dealing with the same kinds of things, a person of the same heart, who really wants to follow God, but it's a struggle. It's a mutual endeavor committed to helping and being helped. Maybe you can pray about that. Who might God bring to you? And as we finish this morning, I'm going to throw out another word, and it's just kind of a roll-your-eye word, maybe. Vivification. Can you even say it? I had to practice it a while. Vivification. What in the world is that? We've been talking about two sides to things. It's the putting to death, but now the bringing to life. The word vivacious, if you know a person that's vivacious, they are just bubbly and maybe not loud, but probably loud, and all over the place, and you're attracted to them. There's just something about them. They're vivacious. They're inviting. Or the word vivid. Boy, it just jumps off the page, the colors, whatever it is, and you just feel alive. Vivification is bringing to life. On one side, we're to put to death. And I could have a whole other sermon on bringing to life with that word, vivify. Galatians 5.16 says, So I say to you, live by the Spirit. Will you do that? Can you do that? When we do that, we don't gratify their sinful nature. 
realistically, we have to realize that this doctrine of mortification, it's going to involve some failure on our part. But don't give up. We will have successes. You can keep moving in that direction. And realize that wherever you stand on any given day before God, whatever you've done today or yesterday, you're standing there by grace. You haven't deserved it, and yet that's where you stand. Whether you've done great acts for him or whether you have failed miserably, you're still standing in his grace. And certainly God's grace is greater than our sin. So those of us that are Christians this morning, we've experienced some joy and motivation in our forgiveness, but at times we, we kind of lose sight of it and we slip away and slip back in our relationship with God. The only cure, as I've been saying in this series of sermons, is preach the gospel to yourself every day. You and I need the gospel every day. Sometimes we hear the gospel and we think, I've heard it a thousand times, and it's for other people. I've already taken care of that. No, it's for you today. And the gospel keeps us living by grace. That's what gives us courage and motivation in this struggle. May you be blessed in that as you think about your life today. Let's bow our heads. This is your God time to reflect and to respond and to talk to him. God, your word has spoken and it speaks powerfully. Your spirit is unique in how it connects it to our lives. And we recognize the spirit's work. It's because God the Father is calling us to be like him, to be holy. Keep calling our name. Keep moving us in that direction one choice at a time. Ways in which we need help and assistance, help us not to be afraid of that. When we're desperate and need to cry out to you, allow us to do that, and allow us also to do the hard job, the tough job of saying no at times. We thank you for these things that your spirit has had for us, for the food that's been on your table that you've given to us today. Allow us to keep feeding on those good things for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's stand. It's Father's Day. We do have a gift for fathers as you go out the door. May God, our Heavenly Father, be with us today in these thoughts and actions that he has spoken to you about. In Jesus' name.